It's okay. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mustafa, for asking me to cover this topic. It is actually a very, very vast topic. Uh, let me see how much justice I can do in the time that is given. So, uh, when I just checked as to the number of clinical trials that have been completed or ongoing in immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer, it is about 1,800. So, that is the amount of interest that is uh, now in immunotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer. So, let me start my talk. So, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction. I will talk about first line, single agent data, combination of immuno-oncology drugs with chemotherapy, combination of immuno-oncology drugs with immuno-oncology. And for each uh, one of the drugs, I will go in this order. There are at least six immuno-oncology drugs that are being tried today. Some of them are approved, some of them are not. So I will touch upon the data of each of these. After this first line, I will talk about second line use of these immuno-oncology drugs and a little bit about beyond immuno-oncology. So what is immunotherapy? I'm sure even the layperson today knows enough about it because there is so much coverage of this therapy in all the magazines. And today we believe after surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy and targeted therapy, immunotherapy is the other pillar of treatment in cancers today. And uh, as you are aware, in 2018, two of these gentlemen got Nobel Prize for this very discovery of uh, cancer cell therapy by inhibition of negative immune system. So that is the importance of immunotherapy today. Uh, so what are we looking at? This is a slide I just put to show you uh, how we are trying to look at uh, leveraging the advantage that we have with immunotherapy. On the left side, if you see, uh, we have... Uh, Sorry. Uh, we have the advantages that we have had with uh, 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 chemotherapy, targeted therapy, etc. And the orange bar, orange line that you see is for the, uh, what we have seen with immunotherapy. And uh, important for you to remember is the tail of this curve, you know, as I've shown here, it is uh, this line, which is parallel to the x-axis which means that there are people who are surviving for long periods of time. If you have this parallel going on for a long period of time, that means you are having a longer, a longer survival in our patients. So that is what we have seen with immunotherapy, that responses are prolonged and people continue to have benefit for prolonged periods of time. Now, what are we trying to see is trying to use combination of all this and have this dotted line that I've shown here. This is what we're trying to see in the future that not only that we are raising this tail of this curve up, but continue it even further. By this, I mean that we are going to increase the number of patients that are benefiting from this orange bar to this dotted line, and again, continue the parallel line of this particular combination that we are looking at. So that's what we are trying to achieve with immunotherapy today. Now, there is a paradigm shift in cancer therapy when we talk about immunotherapy. Historically, we have always been targeting the tumor cells. This is the tumor cells and whatever we've used, including the biologics, is to target the tumor cell. But in immunotherapy, we are not targeting the tumor cell, but we are targeting the immune cell. And more, uh, most importantly, we are talking about the lymphocytes. So the shift is from the tumor cell to the lymphocyte. So that is the important aspect that we need to remember when we talk about the difference between what we were doing so far and what immunotherapy is going to uh, achieve. So this is a very simplified uh, sty uh, slide to tell you about what immuno-oncology is all about. We need to have the T cells in the body getting activated either by the, through the antigen presenting cell or the tumor cell. And this activated T cell by various mechanisms act on the tumor cell and produce cell death. So this is in very simple terms, the summary of immuno-oncology. Now, this again is represented here that uh, the tumor cell has uh, mechanisms by which it suppresses the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. By taking away this blockage by using the monoclonal antibodies, which block this binding of the ligand from the tumor cell to the PD1 and PDL1 receptors on the T cell, we are actually enhancing or uh, recruiting the T cell into the immune system. So, this is the basis for the use of immunotherapy in 
cancer patient treatment. So this is uh, again looking diagrammatically at the evolution of therapy in lung cancer. So starting from lung cancer being one disease, we started looking at histology, a small cell and non-small cell. And yesterday I've shown you why histology breakup is important. And uh, Dr. Mula spoke to you about the molecular pathology and the various driver mutations that we have. And going further today, we are talking about immunotherapy for which one of the important uh, uh, receptors that we look at is the PDL1 expression. The other one is the tumor mutation burden. Tumor mutation burden is still not into routine clinical practice, but PDL1 expression has definitely come into routine uh, clinical use for managing our patients with immunotherapy. So, a word about how we interpret PDL1 this is done essentially by IHC. And uh, again, for, for all IHCs, as we know, we have a grading system based on the intensity of the uh, staining of these uh, monoclonal antibodies. And this is just to show you uh, in a spectrum that on the left side you have a PDL1 that is negative, and on the right side you have one that is highly positive. And in between you have faintly positive and moderately positive. This is important because the responses that we see to immunotherapy essentially is directly proportional to the intensity of the staining that we see. So this is to show you how HNE staining of non-small cell lung cancer looks. And this is the PDL1 staining of the same cancer cells. And you must remember that the PDL1 staining is a membrane staining. That is the cell membrane gets stained as shown here with this uh, brown pigment that is uh, deposited on the membrane. Now, just to give you a brief thing about the drugs, they started somewhere in 1990s with the discovery of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors as they're called. And uh, the first phase one study with nivolumab started in 2012. And in 2020, we have several of them that are available today. And I will show you each one of them as we go along. So the first one I've taken is uh, uh, the drug called pepirolizumab. And uh, just to remind you, all the uh, trials that are done with pembrolizumab have this term called keynote. So when I say that uh, this is a keynote trial, you must reflexly remember that this is a trial that uh, is looking at the role of pembrolizumab. So this is uh, keynote 24, where uh, pembrolizumab was used as a single agent versus chemotherapy. And the important thing to remember here in the study was the PDL1 expression had to be more than 50%. So why is this important? As I showed you, <coughs> the responses are directly proportional to the intensity. And therefore, uh, here is uh, uh, the intensity, which is more than 50%. And we had 305 patients. And this is looking at the overall survival. So if you see, the 12-month overall survival in the pembrolizumab arm was 70% as compared to chemotherapy arm, which was 54%. Now, this is the updated three-year survival. Again, as you see here, pembrolizumab arm, it is 41% versus chemotherapy, 23%. This is keynote 42. So again, as I said, here the patients were included in those who did not have systemic therapy and the PTL1 expression had to be more than 1%. And the pembrolizumab arm was given for two years, whereas chemotherapy was for six cycles. This is the overall survival. And as you can see here at 24 months, the survival for pembrolizumab and arm is 16.7 versus 12 for the chemotherapy. Uh, they started looking at the intensity of the pdl one expression and the correlation. This is to show for those patients who had PDL1 of 1 to 49%. And as you can see here, uh, there is a difference, but not very marked. Uh, this is the other study, Keynote 189, which is looking at pembrolizumab for non squamous And again, very similar design. And if you see here, this is for the PFS. The overall response rate was 47% for pembrolizumab um, with chemotherapy. And for chemotherapy, uh, you can see that there is a difference in the two curves, which is quite evident. A very significant p-value. 
Now looking at overall survival, again you can see that uh, for the pembrolizumab arm with combination it was 69.2% at one year and for the placebo arm that is a chemotherapy arm it was about 50%. And again as you can see in all these uh, graphs the tail of the curve is what we are interested in. So this is for uh, PDL1 more than 50%. Uh, as you can see here, the response rate was 61 versus 22%, which is a difference of almost 40%. And for the PFS and OS, again, you can see the market difference. This is for 1 to 49%. Uh, again, there is a difference, but not so much. And this is for less than 1%. Again, there is a difference of almost 20%. And the responses for less than 1 is not very good. But again, uh, there is... Uh, advantage of combining chemotherapy with the pembrolizumab as a drug, even in those patients who have less than 1% PDL1 expression. So this is again to show you that uh, this is for the non-screamers, if you remember these slides, and uh, what I've shown you is for the uh, squamous here. So, uh, there is a difference in the squamous and the non-squamous. The responses are definitely better in the non-squamous. Although the difference uh, between the pembrolizumab arm and the chemotherapy arm continues to be significantly uh, seen over a period of time. So uh, this is again the author's conclusion, just for you to remember that the survival benefit is there, in including those patients who have a score of less than one, but it's greatest for those where it is more than 50%. So this is the other study, Keynote 407. This is for squamous cell carcinomas. And here, uh, these patients uh, were randomized to pembrolizumab, carboplatin plus paclitaxel versus chemotherapy alone. And after uh, four cycles of this combination, they were put on maintenance pembrolizumab for up to 31 cycles. And again, if you look at the overall survival, uh, it is uh, very significant starting from 12 months and it continues. The median overall survival is 15.9 months versus 11.9 months, 11.3 months for the chemotherapy. And uh, this is again putting all the three together, showing you that uh, there is an advantage of whether the TPS is less than one or more than 50, uh, but it is not as marked as you saw for the non squamous So there is a benefit in either histology but the responses and the benefits are much more in non squamous So again, showing you that uh, this is for the non squamous um, where the differences are much more marked than for the squamous. Uh, next, the drug that we have is atezolizumab, and this is just a summary short slide to talk about various drug, uh, uh, various trials that are being done in first line. Uh, they have an acronym like FER, BIRCH, etc. And this is for some more of these trials that are being uh, done with this molecule. I will show some data for some of these studies. I won't have time to cover all of them. And again, for the atezolizumab uh, studies, the trials are called IM Power. So this is IM Power 150, which was a study done in uh, chemotherapy knife, non squamous histology, but patients who had earlier received some targeted therapy were eligible. And these were the three arms, atezolizumab plus chemotherapy, atezolizumab chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, and chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. And uh, further, this was the maintenance that was going on. For the first arm, it was atezolizumab, second arm, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, and for the third arm, it was bevacizumab. This was a study which was uh, hotly discussed and debated in the World Lung Congress two years ago, uh, where it was presented. So this is uh, the interim overall survival uh, curves for you. You can see that uh, starting from 12 months to 18 months, there is a separation of these curves that continues. Uh, this is the landmark analysis for those patients who were earlier treated with the targeted agents for EGFR and NAL. Again, this is the only study of immunotherapy drugs that have uh, actually enrolled patients who have a targetable mutations have been treated with the targeted drugs and progressed. So we have an evidence to show that this drug can be used even in those patients who have progressed on targeted therapies. 
So this is uh, to show you again the difference in uh, those patients who had uh, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab plus chemotherapy versus no atezolizumab. And you can see that uh, there was a difference here. Whereas uh, for those patients who did not get bevacizumab, the difference was not so much. So this is for patients who did not have uh, any of the uh, alterations. And you can see the difference uh, being 13.2 months versus 9.1 months in favor of using atezolizumab. So the sum summary of this study was that there was a clinical meaningful improvement in PFS and OS in all comers in first line in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So whether they have had a targeted drug or not, but if they have chemotherapy knife, then they will definitely benefit with this combination of chemotherapy, bevacizumab and atezolizumab. This is the other IM132 study, which had the patients without any of these uh, mutations, but no prior chemotherapy. This is a randomization uh, schema. And if you look at the PFS and or response rates and the duration of response, you can see that there was a benefit of atezolizumab. This is for the overall survival again. Uh, I'll be running rapidly through these slides because of the lack of time, but uh, all these are there and uh, you can look them up at your convenience later on. This is uh, atezolizumab for non squamous and uh, <clears throat> this is for patients who were uh, treated uh, previously. And this is the schema of the study. And again, this study showed that even in patients who have had prior uh, therapies, including chemotherapy, uh, using atezolizumab at this stage was in fact beneficial. Uh, there was a difference of median overall survival of two months uh, between chemotherapy and combination with atezolizumab. This is for the intent to treat population for overall survival. And as you can see here, it was 18.6 months for atezolizumab arm versus 13.9 months for no atezolizumab arm. Uh, so this is for overall survival patients with uh, uh, no mutations, either EGFR or ALK. And as you can see here, there is again an advantage in this group of patients as well. So this is IM Power 131, which is a study of atezolizumab in squamous cell carcinomas. And again, the co-primary endpoint was progression-free survival, which was met, and the overall survival as well. At 12 months, there is not much of a difference in overall survival, but if you look at the 24 months, you can see that there's a difference of almost 9%. So even again, showing you that even in squamous cell carcinomas, atezolizumab has a good uh, amount of activity, but not as good as for non squamous which was the similar theme, if you remember, for pembrolizumab. So this is IM power 110, which is a phase three study of atezolizumab versus chemotherapy in first line. That is uh, either squamous or non squamous And uh, these patients are chemotherapy naive, and they're uh, being given atezolizumab in one arm, as against atezolizumab plus chemotherapy. And they do have maintenance arms to continue. And this is the median overall survival that is uh, reported with a significant hazard ratio of 0.59. For the atezolizumab arm, median overall survival of 20 months and for chemotherapy, just a little over 13 months. So now let me come on to the other uh, immuno-oncology drug that we have, uh, which is divilumab. And this is one of the first studies looking at chemotherapy knife patients. And the uh, summary of this was that there was a one year overall survival of 73%. And most important thing here was that the clinical activity was observed regardless of PDL1. So for uh, nivolumab as a single agent, PDL1 does not seem to be an important uh, biomarker to talk about uh, activity uh, because of this study. Uh, whether they were expressing very low or very high uh, activity was seen irrespective of the PDL1 expression. So this is the uh, other uh, one with uh, combination with chemotherapy again in uh, chemotherapy knife patients. This is the schema of the study and uh, this is actually showing you the uh, objective response. Uh, this plot of uh, showing the responses is called swimmer's plot and each line is for response for individual patients. 
So this will actually give you a clear picture about what is happening to each patient, whether they're on treatment, whether they're progressing, whether treatment has been stopped, and if treatment has stopped, whether the activity is continuing. So here, if you see for some of these patients, these dots means that the therapy was stopped and uh, the arrow means that the response is continuing. So in spite of the uh, immunotherapy stop, the response continues to be seen. So this is one of the interesting features that we have observed that uh, even after stopping immunotherapy, the responses continue to be seen in our patients. So this is looking at the overall survival. This is uh, actually looking at different doses of nivolumab, 10 milligrams versus 5 milligrams. And again, showing you that uh, there is no dose response relationship. Even at smaller doses, they do get a better response. Uh, and not necessarily that you need to use a high dose of 10 milligrams per kg. So this is the other uh, study called Checkmate. Again, uh, I think I should remind you here that uh, the studies that involve nivolumab are called Checkmates. And this is Checkmate 2 to 7. This is a very uh, uh, important study because here they have actually used uh, a combination of immunotherapies. Uh, they have used platinum doublets, they've used nivolumab and uh, apilumab as well. So nivolumab and ipilimumab are two immuno-oncology drugs. Uh, nivolumab blocks the PDL1 pathway, whereas ipilimumab uh, blocks the CTLA4 pathway. So this is an example of trying to combine two immunotherapy drugs for benefit. Uh, again, this study looked at TMP as a biomarker, which is tumor mutation burden. And as you can see here, the difference between nivolumab and ipilimumab versus chemotherapy is quite significant. Again, I bring your attention to this tail of the curve, which continues to go, grow and be parallel to the x-axis. So this is uh, looking at overall survival for those patients who are TMB high. And those patients with uh, had the TMB high are the ones uh, doing better on this combination. So this is again what I told you earlier, that the responses to nivolumab was there irrespective of the PDL one And as you can see here, even in those patients who had less than 1% expression, there is an activity and a difference between the use of uh, nivolumab versus chemotherapy. Although not very marked, but definitely it is there. Uh, this is again for uh, PFS. This was a study which looked at TMB, as I told you, as a biomarker. And again, this is showing you that for those patients who had a high TMB, the response was better. And the cutoff for TMB is 10 mutations per megabits. So this is again showing you the overall response rates, uh, which was 36.7% uh, for the combination arm versus 23% for chemotherapy. Uh, this is again the conclusion, which I've already told you that uh, there is effect irrespective of the PDL1, and when combined with chemotherapy, it's definitely better. The other uh, immunology drug we have is uh, durvalumab and tremilimumab. And uh, this is one of the studies called PR34. This is uh, a very new study which is uh, reported recently. Uh, but uh, sadly, this study did not show that there was a benefit of using this. Uh, people are now trying to do postmortem of this study and try to understand why this was so when all the other immunology drugs we've used so far did show good benefit in our patients. So this is uh, Checkmate 9LA, and this is a study in, uh, in those patients who have had no prior systemic chemotherapy. Uh, uh, and uh, they do not have any sensitizing mutations. And this is for looking at the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. So this Checkmate, which I told you all checkmate studies are with nivolumab. This is one with combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab. And these two drugs are made by the same company. So it's easy for them to combine and uh, do a study. So looking at the overall survival, uh, it seems that uh, the overall survival benefit again is seen regardless of PDL1 expression or histology. And at 12 months, the difference is 63% versus 47%. And as you can see here, this continues to uh, go even beyond 24 months. So incorporating uh, all these agents is very important. And some of the things that we have learned is uh, 
to look at the PDL1 expression uh, regardless of histology. But as I've shown you, nivolumab works irrespective of the expression of PDL1. And a patient's likelihood of tolerating taxanes because many of these patients uh, have a backbone of taxane and uh, platinum. And squamous versus non squamous because in non squamous we will use pemetrexin. And of course, patients' willingness to undergo chemotherapy. So if we have patients who are not willing to undergo chemotherapy and the PDL1 expression is high, then you can use immune oncology drugs as a single agent. And this is looking at combining chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. And this is sort of a summary slide of all that I've shown you, the keynote, the checkmate, and the ion power studies. Again, all put together in one slide to show you that this is definitely beneficial. And we have a new modality in immune oncology for treating non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, <clears throat> this is a review article which I just saw very uh, recently, maybe a couple of days ago. And uh, this is in the journal called Immune Network. And I have just uh, shown you the reference here. This is a wonderful uh, review, uh, which is very up to date because this is just published in February 2020. And uh, this actually shows uh, nicely as to all the data that we have today. And this is uh, the first one looking at pivotal studies of immune checkpoint inhibitors in advanced non-small cell lung cancers. All the studies are uh, listed here. And again, at one go, you can compare all the outcomes for these patients. So similarly for chemotherapy combinations, you have this and uh, in the later lines, which is now becoming important because uh, immuno-oncology drugs are approved in first line as I've shown you. So many of our patients will be receiving them as first line. So if they progress on this, what do we have to offer them is what this review article talks about. And we have several agents that are useful uh, beyond progression as well. So there is data for that too. So after this first line, I will touch a little bit upon second line of immuno-oncology drugs. Uh, you know, <clears throat> for a long time after chemotherapy, which was uh, platinum-based compounds, which I spoke to you yesterday, docetaxel was the drug that was approved in second line as compared to best supportive care. Uh, today, we have many of these chemotherapy drugs uh, immuno-oncology drug which are now approved and but docetaxel is a drug that is used as a backbone because that is what is approved in second line and uh, this study is called popular for atezolizumab and uh, this is in the second line which is a phase two study and as you can see here um, there is a difference in the median overall survival of 12.6 months for atezolizumab with docetaxel versus docetaxel alone which is 9.7 then this is nivolumab, a phase three study in the second line, uh, comparing uh, versus docetaxel alone in both histologies. And again, showing you that uh, there is an advantage of using nivolumab as a single agent uh, over docetaxel. Uh, this also holds good for overall survival benefit. And this is a keynote study. As I told you, pembrolizumab is the drug associated with keynote studies. And uh, this is a one is to one is to one randomization of two different doses of pembrolizumab versus docetaxel as a control arm. And uh, here, as you can see, 23% of these patients went beyond third line. And uh, this is to talk about the overall survival, again showing you uh, whether you use 2 mg or 10 mg, there was a benefit of uh, pembrolizumab over docetaxel. So there was, again, important to remember, there was no difference between PDL1 being used as a predictive uh, marker for the response to these uh, drugs. So again, to show you that uh, we have uh, drugs beyond the third line. Um, and this is again from the same review article, very nicely summarized here as to how we're going to use immunotherapy for non-small cell uh, lung cancer. You look at the histology first, and based on the, after the histology, you look at the PDL1 expression. And if it is more than 50%, we have this drug approved pembrolizumab as single agent. Uh, if it is less than one, you look at the tumor mutation burden. Uh, one important thing you must remember is most labs are still not very well equipped to estimate the tumor mutation burden. So you need to remember that. And if that is high, then you have evidence for using a combination nivolumab plus cipulumab without chemotherapy. Whereas if it is between one and 49, 
you have several of these combinations which I've already shown you with the data showing that it is definitely advantageous to use immunotherapy. In squamous, if it is less than one, again, you look for TMB. And if that is high, you have the same combination. But if it is less than one, then you have pembrolizumab and atezolizumab and again nivolumab, which uh, the data is not very encouraging for squamous, but these two agents have good activity even in squamous histology. So one thing we must remember is we always talk about uh, the difference between PFS and OS. Um, it is important to remember for all the immuno-oncology drugs, there does not seem to be a great advantage of progression-free survival as we see with standard chemotherapy. But a very significant overall survival benefit is seen with immuno-oncology drugs. And this is to do with the way that these drugs act. And uh, to explain that, I don't have time today. So it's very interesting to know this because the way immunotherapy drugs act is different from the way that the classical chemotherapy drugs act. So is PDL one the current biomarker to use? Uh, as of today, that seems to be the best, but this is a cartoon I put in to show you that there are so many other markers that we can look at. And uh, there is work going on targeting many of these markers. Um, be it with dendritic cell, peripheral tissue tumor cell, tissue macrophages, regulatory T cell, and the affected T cell. So there is an interplay happening between all these cells and the tumor cell, and uh, we will see more data for targeting many of these uh, biomarkers in the future. So this is a list I've just put in to show you that uh, we have data today of use of these drugs in the first line for over 10,000 patients. That is a huge amount of data that you can reliably use for day-to-day -day practice uh, in treating your patients. Um, so going beyond, uh, we know that some of these uh, tumors do not express PDL1 very highly. And uh, for many drugs, this overexpression is important. So what do we have to try and see if we can increase this expression? And uh, what we have is use chemotherapy or radiotherapy to increase the expression of these uh, antigens on the tumor cells by which the immune system will recognize these tumor cells as non-self and uh, bring about uh, the uh, recruitment of the immune system into killing the tumor cells. So the other thing I thought I will just touch upon is beyond immunotherapy, as I've already told you, why this is important. Uh, sadly, as of now, we don't have any phase three trials, but there are several trials going on. And one of them is with this drug called Etinostat, uh, which is uh, again in combination with uh, PDL1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab. And uh, Etinostat is a HDAC inhibitor. And uh, this initial data shows that uh, they can be um, good responses that are seen. And just to tell you, I'm sure you know, this is called a waterfall plot. Again, this is individual patient uh, data that is plotted. If it is coming down, that means there are responses. If it is going up, that means there is progression. Uh, and they can be color coded for the responses that are there. This is called a spider plot. Again, individual patient responses over time. And uh, you can see what is happening over time for each one of these patients. This is the responses given at a particular fixed point of time, but this is over time what happens, the trend that is seen with responses over time. So these are two important graphs that you need to remember and use them for depicting the responses in your patients. So the important thing when any new drug comes is the side effects that we are worried about. Fortunately, addition of these two uh, did not increase the number of grade three and four side effects, which is always bothersome to us. And uh, they tried looking at uh, some sort of association of other markers, uh, but this is still very, very early for us. Um, now, the other drug is ramacirumab, which is a VEGF monoclonal antibody. And uh, this is already approved in lung in second line. And this is a phase one study of com combining these two. And as you can see here, this is done across several solid tumors, including lung cancer. And this is some very early data showing that, in fact, uh, as I told you, PFS is not an important thing. We may not see great differences in PFS when you use immuno-oncology drugs, but overall survival benefit is what we are looking at. So with that, I think I will stop and I just give you a very broad bird's eye view of 
all that that is happening with the various immuno oncology drugs that are available today and how you can use it for benefiting your patients of course the most important thing is the cost for treating our patients in the subcontinent